welcome back to CSR 142, the Car Shopping Round Challenge, where I've been designing and building the Transit Star Centaur in an attempt to win a community competition for the best luxury car, not just overall, but for a specific buyer. If you haven't seen the last three episodes in which I go through the whole process of designing my car, you might still want to watch those, but if you just want to see some community-built automation cars get roasted, well, then I'm afraid you're in the right place. The CSR format involves taking all the cars that were submitted and then eliminating them one by one in separate rounds to judge them in different aspects. So after you submit your car, you get the next uh, round of eliminations, and then you hope that your car wasn't mentioned, because that means you're closer to the finals. So, the very first cars to get mentioned in this CSR are the Insta Bins, the Rule Breakers. California, October 1995. Excerpt from the Evening TV News. In one of the largest civil penalties under the Clean Air Act, three automakers, Schnell, Findel, and Manda, have been ordered to recall a total of 975,000 vehicles from model years 1991 to 1995 and pay a combined $80 million fine for anti-pollution programs and repairs. The EPA discovered that the three companies colluded to cheat emissions testing with an engine control unit programmed to enrich the air-fuel mixture whenever the climate control system was turned on, producing over three times the legal limit of carbon monoxide emissions. These increased emissions were not recorded in the lab as EPA tests are conducted with the climate control system turned off. Both the EPA and the U.S. Justice Departments contend that the emission standards were intentionally violated, an accusation the automakers vehemently deny. Yeah, so basically, these three cars are the only ones to get kicked out for straight-up rule violations, and they went over the uh, trim emissions limit. I think one person probably made some tiny changes and went over by like a little bit, and another person just, like, was looking at the engine emissions number, which is completely unrelated, and got screwed that way. The good news for me is that means that with no rule violations, the Transit Star Centaur is still in the running. Now, the next round basically involves the character, Jason Zhang, visiting his mechanic and asking him for an opinion on some of the cars he might be looking at. So, because in character he's not like a car expert, but of course we're going to be discussing these cars in detail. However, one car gets a special mention as being so truly awful that it can't even exist. Jason's mechanic says, you know the story of the Blue Star, right? Well, after a short seller released a very damaging report on his company, the feds did an investigation on their own and have just charged a founder with securities fraud. Blue Star had a promise of building a sustainable and affordable luxury car for the future, whatever that is, but what the government alleges is that he deliberately misled investors into believing that their first car, the Blue Star 111, was entering production when he knew that really it had barely made any progress. The show cars were made with a barely functional and cobbled together motorcycle engine or something. And on top of that, a junk 4-speed manual transmission that doesn't even work. Once the investors realized their predicament, it was too late. Some claimed to have lost their entire retirement savings. <laughs> oh my! But aside from that one complete disaster, the rest of the mechanic bins just include a short summary of each vehicle. And this whole time I'm reading it trying to guess if my stats are better or worse than theirs, since I don't get access to the spreadsheet until the very end. So the first vehicle up is the Deleu Mathers 1610 V8. 
And Thomas the Mechanics Review says that the car is torn between being a drag special or a luxury cruiser. However, the handling's not very good for a luxury cruiser, and the uh, it lacks good safety. That comes up a lot in every car that shows standard 90s. Uh, even if they had a good safety number overall, that characterizes as like lacking in safety features since you would expect the best features in a car like this. And the mechanic also says he thinks they're a nightmare to work on, which is saying that car has high service costs. Sure enough, in the spreadsheet, you can see that the trim service cost is $1,478 per year estimated, which is like $200 higher than mine. And the reliability is under 60, and both of those during a warning and there's a big orange flag for the standard 90s safety type. The Leighton Kronos gets slammed for only having a V6, making it much slower than the competition, as well as no dual frontal airbags, which is a reference to it having standard safety again. Uh, the mechanic says, I know you're not cheap for the sake of it. And this car was probably trying to get it on a very low price. It's only $34,000, which is impressive, but 180 horsepower doesn't seem to cut it here. The Altra XCV 3.6 Air Ride. The mechanic comments that it's kind of mainstream and not that sporty, which I guess I can see looking at it. He says it's reasonably competitive, although it has grabby brakes which is a reference to the brake pads being left at the default value of 50, which is a complaint that's also going to come up on other cars later. He says it's built reasonably low with reasonably good engine, a lot of reasonable, but is air suspension really necessary? You have to admit air suspension is cool though. The Sovain Athena LSE. For something named after the Goddess of Wisdom, there are too many unwise choices. Namely, the poorly tuned turbocharged V6 that's unusually prone to failure, bad brakes, bad steering, bad tires, and it's overpriced. This car is actually the least reliable car in the entire competition, which is fairly impressive. Even worse than that wacky 2.2 V8. And I think it supports my theory that automation, the game itself, just hates V6 engines. They're always worse than something. There's no V6s in the final list at all, though there are some straight 6s. IP Icarus V6. Poor thing didn't stand a chance. The first car to actually move on is the Frog Eye Scorpio, despite maybe some iffy looks, and really all the mechanic has to say about it is negative stuff. The engine bank angle is weird, the brakes aren't that great, but I guess not finding any reason to throw it out is a pretty good thing. Looking at the spreadsheet, we can see it's a rear wheel drive automatic with about 50 drivability, 12 sportiness, 55 comfort, 50 practicality, 58 safety. Really looking at those numbers, by comparison, I feel like I should be doing pretty good. So it's a good sign, maybe. And he's also making 276 horsepower. So a little more powerful than my car, but, you know, we'll see. Stop being a communist and buy domestic. Fuck you, buy our car. The 1995 Deer and Hunt Times Grand Baltimore, ultimate luxury for everybody. Hear the roar of a thousand bald eagles when you push the pedal on an all-American made 400 cubic inch engine. Every Times comes with extra big cup holders and new King Drive suspension to make sure you won't spill a single drop of your extra large coffee. We guarantee that. Deer and Hunt, in power we trust. But the mechanic says this car is well out of place here, and for all the bad reasons. It's got a body on frame, solid axle, and while that doesn't ruin it, it's not very performant either. The 6.5 liter V10 only makes 290 horsepower. It's got high service costs, and it doesn't have the best safety features. So basically, it's a piece of garbage. The Kazon Laguna VST. This one actually hurts a little bit to see Bin, because it actually has a best-in-class drivability of 71 and 20 sportiness. 
of a mechanic describes it as maybe too sporty. But it does have some expensive sports tires, a turbocharged V6, which is cursed, and has a uh, maintenance cost of over $1,500, which is pretty crazy. So I guess I can see why it gets thrown out. The Stelesi 6L. He says it's a pretty good car, although it suffers from a little too ambitious features. It's got hydro-pneumatic suspension, which apparently he doesn't like, I guess high maintenance costs and stuff, and an aluminum body, which probably also contributes to the maintenance costs. I have to admit, it's not a very realistic choice for a car like this. I can't pronounce this. It's honestly quite incredible that Mog found it fitting to get a literal truck engine, turbocharge it, and shoehorn it in the front of a passenger car. This is the most powerful car in the competition at 361 horsepower, but it's made with a weird turbocharged 5-liter 6-cylinder, which is just crazy and not very smooth for a luxury car. It also gets dinged for bad brakes and a front-forward all-wheel drive system, which had one or two other cars also got dinged for. Skipping past a few cars with similar complaints that got binned, the Kaufman Gestalt 380 is the next car to actually move on to the next round of competition. The interesting thing is, even on this car, he's still complaining about the brakes. I feel like 66 Mazda might have a little high standards on brakes for a 90s luxury car, but maybe it's just me. The Mustang-like Quadra Intruder is also moving on to visual judging. It's got a V8, some good horsepower, and he comments that it's a very good value for money. At only $40,000, and with some stats that really compare to my car and others quite favorably, it's doing pretty well. That was only the first half of the mechanic's rejection bins. At this point, we'd have to wait five more days for the second half to finally know who would be going on to the visual round. At this point, I was feeling like I had a pretty good chance, but nothing's for sure. The Durandal Verona gets a lot of compliments mentioning a good V8, high power, all-wheel drive, active suspension, and high comfort. It's a little warning sign that there's a basic power steering, but this is a good example of a car that I think mainly got let down just by the lack of corrosion resistance, using basic steel instead of galvanized or something. It kind of hurts to see you lose for that, because that's a good car. Ooh, the moment I've been waiting for. The Transit Star Centaur is up. Many of these get converted to stretch limos due to their impressive levels of comfort. Good so far. Mostly due to active suspension and a well-built interior. Yeah, that plus four quality paid off. A reputable company will report uh, will reinforce various components of the car to withstand its weight and the stress. As a daily commuter, besides being serene, its front-wheel drive layout sacrifices handling dynamics for overall better security, a trade-off most will not mind. I was actually surprised. I think I was like one of the only front wheel drive cars. The engine makes enough power. Yeah, I hope it does. Uh, however, considering its weight, the braking system is under engineered for its task. Also, parts are surprisingly expensive, even for this class of car. Verdict? Tier 3 bin. Well, as you know if you watched my previous videos, I had a little trouble stuffing that V8 in there, and it's probably where a lot of the service costs come from. That and having a luxury interior instead of like a premium interior or something. However, the brakes kind of bothered me. So I asked about it in Discord, and I figured out that what I had chosen was solid discs, and vented discs are pretty much necessary. Now, I thought vented discs were like uh, slotted and drilled rotors, like they were really intended for sports cars and not necessarily on like a luxury car like this. In my defense, the vented discs in the game are even slotted, so it confused me a little bit. But in fact, I realized that vented discs are these things, and they're on every car I've seen from the 90s onward, including economy cars. So really, I guess I learned something. That's right, I, I should have really had vented discs. I also thought 2% sportiness brakes fade would be acceptable, but I mean, I wouldn't have had it if I had the proper brakes anyway. Of course, it kind of hurts knowing I was probably one click away from being able to pass the mechanic section, but there's a ton of people trying to win CSR and you really have to be the best of the best, so just a couple mistakes and you're out. 
The next car to get binned is the Valens Amerisys. Much like the Transit Star, he says, it's got a lot of great features, including a crazy dual overhead cam 5 valve V8, which is just ridiculously expensive. In fact, it's right on the edge of the budget and didn't leave any money for corrosion resistance. As the mechanic says, it's highly unacceptable for nearly any car, much less a car in this price range. Imp 633. I think this is a pretty good looking car, but it gets knocked out for a six cylinder engine with a manual transmission and some crazy expensive options like aluminum body panels, sports tires, hydro suspension, all of which make it too high in service costs but weak in power. RCM Regal V8. The mechanic flavors this as a large mainstream manufacturer attempting to move up market and make luxury cars. The issue with this one is that the comfort stat is hurt a lot because semi-trailing arm suspension is used in the rear. It's a cheap option, but it's just not good enough for a luxury car. It's more of a Honda Civic kind of thing. Another car that's moving on to the next round. The KPS K10 is a highly capable all-rounder with a 276 horsepower V8, high level of interior appointments, and an expertly tuned suspension that balances comfort and drivability well. Unfortunately, this also serves as good proof that in the car market, design often wins the day. I think that's a polite way of saying you get knocked out because it's ugly. The Turbo C400 is another car that we're moving on. The mechanic also describes this as a car made by a company which normally makes cheaper vehicles, and in this case I think the reason he describes it that way is just because it's at a relatively low price. It's got a big V8, all-wheel drive, and fuel economy of under 18 miles per gallon generates a warning but doesn't knock it out. Sell your Benz. In the 1980s, America turned to imported vehicles for world-class luxury and performance. But now with its 1995, the Somerville Spear delivers Germanic levels of sophistication and power made in Texas. This raises some questions with me about whether Mercedes actually exists in this universe, along with these hundred other brands we haven't heard of apparently. But uh, the mechanic says it's got great power from the V8, good handling, and a great interior. So it's moving on to the next round. The Vogel SE4, the darling of villains everywhere. I'm sure you've seen more than the fair share of them in the movies. Apparently this thing manages to have 300 horsepower from a 6 liter V12 with all wheel drive and at the same time fairly low service costs. I'm honestly not sure how he pulled it off. Not surprisingly, this is another car that moves on. In fact, Every car from here on in the post is moving on to the next round, so let's try and get through them relatively quickly. Here's the Voltari Halcyon 2.9 Turbo all-wheel drive. It's a complete opposite on the size spectrum from the last car we looked at. The Xi Zhejiang L1 Executive. Another V12 with a lot of power and all-wheel drive and a surprisingly low service cost. In fact, looking at the spreadsheet, it's got all the features I have and more, such as an LSD. So I guess the main thing that does it is just a large engine bay or something. Anyway, this car is moving on. Othlin A780. Nothing stands as crazy with the design, but it's got good performance all around at a $41,000 price. Hakuru Seren Super Royale AD4. A Japanese style V8, that is, dual overhead cam with all-wheel drive. The Marksman 95 ETB-A. This is an interesting collaboration between two players that makes it thematically Japanese-Australian, so a real Frankenstein of a car. However, the mechanic really likes it. It's got a six-cylinder getting 271 horsepower, beating many competitors in both gas mileage and performance. The mechanic also describes the suspension tuning as godlike, and although he didn't use a uh, fully active suspension, I take a moment to toot my own horn and say that I did have better drivability, sportiness, and comfort. Finally, the last car in the challenge, the High Node Lucent. 
another Japanese V8. The mechanic says that the air suspension is a bit of a concern, but overall, despite some poor reliability, it's a worthwhile car to look at. Now, every car that's received the mechanic's approval will go through visual judging. If the car is too ugly, it'll be knocked out right away. If it's not in this list, it becomes a finalist to be picked out of the best of the best. Without further ado, here's the ugly cars. More specifically, cars can be knocked out either for being simply ugly or for being okay looking but not really appropriate for the luxury market. This, the KSP K10, is an ugly car. The issues cited are a severe lack of design direction and too many fixtures, and particularly the exhaust and front light and vent arrangement are the wrong sized or not well proportioned to each other. I agree with that. You can see the awkward gap between, for example, the rear bumper and the bottom of the taillights. The Frog Eye Scorpio suffers from a lot of awkward empty space in the front of the vehicle, and the very rounded design in the front seems to almost be fighting the harsh rectangles in the back. The Turbo C400 looks cheaper than it should look, and more sport-oriented than luxury-oriented. While I think it looks cool, I have to agree. The Quadra Intruder is in a similar position, looking far too aggressive. He also complains about the weird grill insert, although I kind of like that. The Somerville Spear is described as too limo-like and stiff, although I think that's kind of rough because I guess he was kind of screwed as soon as he picked that body. The Vogel SE4, he says, was almost good enough to go on, except for the weird headlights that sort of stick out of the front. I have to admit, I'm not sure I've seen a real car that looks like that, although I don't mind it. He also complains again of a square front, round rear situation. The L1 Executive gets knocked out for suitability reasons. The spoiler's too aggressive, and the plastic cladding looks cheap. Now, while this does look a lot like a Subaru Outback from the era, I feel like I have to point out that the Lexus LS400 had a pretty distinctive two-tone plastic cladding like this. However, he probably should have gone for a more subtle color. The Kaufman has good fixture design, but gets knocked out for being too bulbous and stubby in the rear third. I have to wonder if he was just a couple morph adjustments away from the perfect car, or if he got screwed by his body choice here. Incidentally, I find myself wondering, how would my car be doing if I had got to this stage? Well, we can get a pretty strong hint from the 0 to 10 style ranking given in the spreadsheet. Unfortunately, I only got a 2 out of 10. I'm pretty sure I would have been knocked out. That makes me worse than anything in this round, except for the KPS. However, I can at least say I didn't get a 0 out of 10, which several people did. It hurts after dumping so much time into trying to get the styling right, but I guess I'm not that good at it. I have to admit though, those rear tail lights look pretty funky. I should have put some bumper bars over the little joints or something. With that, we're finally on to the finals, whereas the last three rounds have really all been about picking out things that are wrong with each car or reasons why it should be eliminated and can't move on, this is the one that really compares the best attributes of each car against the other cars to pick out the final car that our character Jason Jane will purchase. There's a literal novel written about each car, and for the video I'm just going to try and go through quickly and focus on the most salient points that I can use to make them distinct from each other. It's also interesting to note there's some commonalities in the finalists. For example, every single finalist has a galvanized steel chassis and a partial aluminum body panel setup. And the engines, with the one exception of the Turbo Voltari, are right about 4 liters. They also all have a good balance of stats without sticking out like crazy in any one area. The cars with the best drivability and sportiness were actually eliminated for visual reasons, and the car with the best comfort was eliminated back in the mechanical round. They also all have a longitudinal engine mounting, and none of them have active suspension setups, which probably explains how they came in without having a massive maintenance cost like my car did. 
Now, each of the finalists gets a segment where the character goes and gives it a test drive and just sort of describes how he feels about it. So the Marksman ETB, he describes it as having a very nice interior with a lot of space inside, which makes sense. The Inline 6 is the star of the show, providing good power, and the transmission does a good job of delivering that power as well. The only downside that he gives is that the suspension is rather soft, and the car tends to lean a lot on tight corners, although it's great on the highway. Looking at the spreadsheet, we can see in a little more detail where this comes from. The Marksman has one of the highest cornering Gs of any of the finalists, but it also has the most body roll, which is an interesting combination to arrive at. The High Node Lucent is the sportiest car of the bunch, and actually by a decent margin, and it makes good power and quietly. The five-speed automatic is one of the best in the market, even better than the four-speed that he praised on the last car. It's slightly aggressive and has a slightly rougher ride, but the air suspension does a good job of balancing this out. In fact, it actually has a very slightly higher comfort rating than the Marksman he just drove, although that might be made up with interior features rather than the soft suspension. The third test drive is the Hikaru Saren. Immediately as he sees the car, he notes the impressive fitment to the body panels. That's a reference to the quality sliders, which are pretty high on the body. He also says he's befuddled by the large screen in the center console, which is the luxury CD player. I find that kind of funny. Imagine yourself in the 90s, the first car you see with a digital display. The V8 is very smooth, but it has the least acceleration out of the cars he's testing. And the 4-speed automatic doesn't do an amazing job of using that power either. It's got long ratios. All-wheel drive makes it very smooth, but the ride is judged to be a bit out of control due to relative stiffness and lack of damping. I'm not sure that even shows up in a spreadsheet, but I'm sure it's there in the fine details of the suspension tuning. The Voltari Halcyon Executive 2.9 Turbo is described as one of the most forward-thinking and modern cars he's looked at, which is pretty accurate to his design philosophy of a small engine and turbo as well as the visual design. He says, however, that the engine has a lot of power, but the power band's a little narrow, so the power is hard to use, and it suffers from a similar problem as the last car, with a long gear ratio in the 4-speed automatic, which makes that power a little difficult to get. He also describes the suspension very similarly to the way he described the High Node Lucent, where it's basically excellent all around, but a little stiff and rough on bad roads. The last test drive of the day is the Othlin A70. When he sees the car, he knows that the body assembly isn't up to the standards of the competition. That just means it has a neutral quality slider on the body. However, the uh, interior comfort is good, and it says that even though it has a less powerful engine than most of the cars, it has an excellent transmission to make use of it, which means that it doesn't get left behind. The suspension's excellent and makes good use of some adaptive bits, although it's not a full adaptive suspension, and it handles small and large bumps well. The one thing that he mentions is negative is that it has some slight fidgeting on the highway. I actually have no idea where this comes from, but the pattern so far definitely shows us that 66 Mazda doesn't say things about cars for no reason, so I'll assume there's some logic behind it. It's been a long competition, but ultimately there can be only one winner. And that winner is the High Node Lucent, proving that what wins the day is good power and great transmission design. Although air suspension turned out to be a good idea after all, too. Thanks so much to 66 Mazda for hosting this competition, and thanks for everyone who participated. And if you've watched this video so far, thank you too. I know it's a long one, and I hope it stayed interesting and didn't get too boring. I just felt like I really wanted to do justice to all the details that go into making and judging these cars. The next CSR is already underway, and I'm probably pretty late to join in since making this video took a lot longer than I thought it would. If you'd like to see anything more like this, go ahead and leave a comment and let me know what you think. And in the meantime, don't get too salty down there.
Grazie, amore.